Welcome again, guys. Here we are today with the one and only Paul Gibbs. Paul, how are you today? I'm very well, Louis. Yourself? Oh, I'm happy to be here today, Paul, with you. That's good. And check out some of the birds and have a bit of a chat. Guys, Paul's going to be selling some birds with us, so sign up to hopauctions.com and don't miss your chance to buy some of these great birds. Uh, Paul, so... Uh, we came here to have a bit of a chat and talk about how you raced birds in the past. And so, can you tell us how you got into pigeons? Yeah, well, pigeons I started with when I was about 14 years of age, uh, basically through high school. Yep. You know, plenty of young bakers in those days had pigeons, feral pigeons and whatever else. The first really, what I call a race pigeon I had, was one I bought from a poultry farmer. He had all these pigeons. He was trying to get rid of it from the poultry farm. And there was one in there with a, a, a ring and a rubber race ring. And um, I fell in love with that, took it home. And gradually over the years, you know, they developed into more and more qualities. You got rid of the road peckers and uh, improved the quality of what you had in your loft. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. It's a good start. And so, Paul, if you could tell us a little bit about the origin and the strain of the birds that you have. Well, at the moment, my base pigeons are van loons. Right. Um, I like to say that, you know, when I'm talking about my birds to different people, I, I say that they're uh, Van Loon based birds. But my original Van Loon pigeons came from a late friend of mine who passed away not that long ago, Steve Beverly, and he uh, gifted me a pair of cocks of his number one pigeon Titleist. And when I took them over into my own loft, I found that within a couple of years, they were just dominating the performance of the pigeons. So in the pursuing years, Steve was generous enough. He kept sending pigeons down from Brisbane and they you know, very soon uh, overtook the loft. The old, old pigeons I had, which were Stan Graham pigeons, I moved them on and um, the Van Loons basically took over. And to those Van Loons, I increased other Van Loons from other sources like Greg Hamilton and a few other places and blended them together. And specifically which lines? Oh, well, the ones from Steve Beverly come right down from the original um, eggs through Ray Hunt in Western Australia. They were not 82 rung, 83 rung, and they were from the original birds. And Steve Beverly kept his family of pigeons uh, straight and inbred. The problem, they were getting a little bit too inbred on Steve's side. And that's those scrumpy <coughs> lines, is it, that's been doing yeah. a lot of winning around the place for some of the other guys we've interviewed and met many others in Australia? Basically scrumpy lined um, with a lot of the other main pigeons of uh, the Planet Brothers. Right. Uh, of course, Des Sippets brought in what I believe to be the first legal shipment of Van Loons. And of course, they still went back to scrumpy and a few of the other top pigeons of uh, Van Loons. And I've tried to concentrate on them over the years as best I can without inbreeding too much. Right, and uh, I say at the moment I have been increasing the the variety of the birds in the loft with a few introductions uh, to try and keep the line going. Yes, I've, I've not wanted to outcross too much. If I do introduce an outcross, I want to try and select the best young ones on performances raced by other people, and then look at putting them back to my original van loons, and then to move the outcross on. Yeah, so we're we're constantly. Um, building that line of birds with performance, performance and performance. Well, I hope to, Louie. I'm, I'm looking all the time at what I'm putting in. Um, I say recently, whether you want to say it's a fortune or misfortune. Well, they, these are field-tested birds um, amongst many different lofts across oh, the country, aren't they? I think myself, there's been a lot of good pigeons coming into the country over recent years, but I always say to people, the Van Loons have, have stood the test of time. Since those early days of 83, you know, I think, a rough guess, it's over 30 years that those pigeons are still winning and performing for flyers all around Australia. Now, there's nothing to say that imports that have come in in recent years are, um, are as good as or better, but um, some of them have come into the, into the country over the years and have faded away a little bit. But the Van Loons always seem to be there when you read about people's breeding and pedigrees and results. Quite often you'll see a Van Loon mentioned somewhere in a pedigree. Well, that's right. I, I know of a lot of Van Loons that are behind, of these exact lines, that are behind some birds who have won one-loft races down in Adelaide. So mm. you definitely have the right lines of Van Loons here, Paul. Yeah, well, I know uh, a friend of mine, uh, Steve Shears, he, he bought a pair 
of pigeons that were van loon based mm -hmm. um, uh, from another well-known flyer, John Folks, and he bred a, a, a one loft Adelaide winner. I think I think it might have won two, and um, yeah, but they're just there. They just always seem to be there for people. That's right. Yeah, that's they're right. not all winners. I, I hate to, to <laughs> tell people that they're all going to win. There's no such guarantee, but they just keep rising to the top. You know, well, that's right. There. There's no guarantees, but we can guarantee that these birds are line bred and tested to performance pigeons. Well, I mean, that, that's the thing. I've always been happy, you know, with, with my friend. That's unfortunately, he's passed away recently, Steve Beverly. And I've always been able to ring Steve. If I wanted to to borrow or gain another pigeon to put back to him, he's always been too happy, you know, more than happy to send them down. And I've used them over a long period of time. And when Steve passed away, I wanted to make it a point of myself to, to go to his sale and, and buy one really good pair of uh, line bred van loons to put back to what I've got to keep that gene pool going. Absolutely. And, uh, but the problem with people like Steve passing uh, is that a lot of those pigeons may tend to be diluted over a period of time and trying to get them in the future might be hard. Right. And we're sort of putting them back into the original birds here. Yes, I'm, ho I'm hopeful of getting some successes, some nice, really nice young pigeons in there that are very, very close to the original ones I've got. They might have a touch of something in them, but um, I'm pleased with the breeding the last few years. Well, I definitely know that there's guys who have won at one loft race level that come and get birds from Paul and, and those birds have gone on and won young bird derbies down on the south coast and beat all their birds in their own lofts. So guys, there's definitely performance in the birds from Paul. Yeah, well the birds have done real well no matter where they've where they've gone, as I said to you early, Louis. The only place I've never sent my birds is to South Australia for whatever reason. But I've sent them to every other state, even in down in Tasmania. Yep. And birds have done well as far north as Rockhampton. They've yep. performed for guys up there. And uh, you know, they just seem to go well in the hands of various flyers. It's not just a matter of having um, you know, the, the, the pigeon and having to work out or, or buy the system off the flyer. They just fly all those sort of locations, regional locations. Well, it speaks city. to the quality of the birds here. It does. Yeah, it? it's not only management, but the birds, the birds. thrive under different sorts of yeah. management as well. And they're good cross pigeons. You know, they'll cross with many other different families. You know, yeah. They're, they're just so, so adaptable. Well, it's because they're nice line bred. They, they've got the performance in them and they'll cross out well. Uh, Paul, we also had a few uh, first fed, I think, in Perth out of your birds as well. Yeah, a couple of years ago now, there was a flyer over there, he, he, two weeks in a row. Mm -hmm. He'd done very well in Perth. He, he was you know, kind enough to, to ring me and let me know that the birds had done well. You know, and I was more than ecstatic you know, to get those sort of reports. Um, oh, that's excellent. Yeah, and it's always good. To, as I say, last year in um, Queensland, from a previous year, these pigeons were two-year-olds from a previous year. One of the flyers up there, he got um, four uh, about top 15 federations in the QPF mm -hmm. with two-year-old pigeons. He, he was more than happy. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pleased to get the results I get over the last few years, seeing I'm not racing myself. It's always good when other people do well with their pigeons. Yeah, and not only do they do them well, they're, they're topping thirds and they're topping combines, so that's excellent. Yeah, well, these pigeons, are like the last year or so in, in Campbelltown, I did very well. I mean, I've had two stints of periods of racing pigeons in Campbelltown, right. and they've always done well. One of the a cock I had from my original uh, Steve Beverly Van Lerns, a young cock, when uh, Cumberland had a lot bigger membership than they've got today, uh, topped the Fed two weeks, or topped the Fed one week, um, and then the following week I doubled him back and he got second Fed, so he got a first, second Fed two weeks in a row against yeah, 9,000 pigeons which was, oh, I thought was a phenomenal effort. Yeah, against 9,000 pigeons, that's, yeah. yeah. No, so they're, they're just um, pigeons that adapt very well. Mm -hmm. And um, when I moved location up here the first time, I bred pigeons for a, a fellow in, in Port Macquarie, who's, who's, unfortunately he's passed away too. But he won uh, the national up here, Young Bird National. Um, one of the other flies up here I bred pigeons for, and um, they got uh, Mid-North Coast Federation Bird of the Year with one of the, the Van Loon pigeons. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't seem to to really matter where they are. They seem to, to fly well. A friend yeah, of mine, sort of all geography and terrain. Yeah, well, a friend of mine in Newcastle, he uh, he topped his fed in, in a derby down there as well with, with a pigeon. And one of the years I flew, last years I flew in Campbelltown, I got um, 
second overall in the All Age Derby uh, from Ivanhoe with a, yep. a young hen, a Van Loon hen. So they just seem to, you know, I can't praise them enough really. They're just very consistent pigeons. That's right. They've got results from the past and up until today they are still performing for, oh, for many flyers. That's right. You've only got to look at flyers like, um, you know, uh, Hamilton. You know, Hamilton's had Van Loon Jansons uh, as a base family for many, many years and had terrific success in South Australia yeah. with them. And, and people who have got the pigeons from Greg Hamilton have always seem to have done well. Yeah, so it's just, uh, just a phenomenal strain of pigeons. Oh, absolutely. Well, Paul, I'm glad that you kept the birds uh, for so long and you've, you've line bred them. And you're, Paul is actually one of those pedigree expert kind of guys. He, you name a bird and, and Paul knows it. He knows where it comes from. He knows its origin. And, and he's got the stock sense that um, has bred some, some, some great birds here. Well, I, I, sorry, Lou. Yeah. As I've often said to people, you know, pedigree is, is, is the base where you start. Now, I know a lot of flyers in the past, I've spoken to them, don't care. Don't care about the pedigree. But you've got to start somewhere. And the pedigree gives you the best possible chance of breeding winners. If you've got a pedigree that's got generations of winners and perform pigeons, but like nobody goes to the, the, the horse sales, the million dollar horse sales, and buys a horse that's got no, no pedigree. You know, they're looking to buy yearling horses that are well bred. Again, no guarantee. But some of these guys build, spend millions of dollars on racehorses. Well, that's right. That, that, that uh, performance has to come out somewhere. Yeah. Um, you've got to start somewhere. And a yeah. pedigree should always be where you start. Mm. If, if it's not the bird, a good race himself, it might be a producer. Well, you but he's know. got to have that performance in the background. That's what Paul's saying here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's excellent, Paul. Thanks. Okay, Paul. So we know you're not racing anymore, but a lot of people watch this channel to pick up some of the tips from the old school flyers who really knew how to fly a bird. <laughs> so... If you could tell us uh, how you'd go when your birds came back on a, on a, uh, from a race day on a Saturday, what would they eat on arrival? Well, I used to like to feed them a light food early on the mm -hmm. first day of arrival. I, I didn't like to, to fill them up too much and always had um, something in the water, whether it was, uh, I'm a big believer in that nat natural product, uh, natural iron. I'd right. either have some of that in the water and I'd try to make the water as warm as possible. You should never give returning birds cold especially on a cold day, you should never give them cold water. It should at least be room temperature, if not a little bit higher. It encourages them to drink. Right. <laughs> but um, feeding wise, I I'd like to feed them a light mix early mm -hmm. and then probably on the, the Sunday or Monday start to build them up a little bit more with a bit of heavier grain. Yeah, and we're heavier, so what are we giving them, corns or, or peas? Um, over the years I've changed. I I've sort of peas and high protein early in the week. Mm -hmm. and start to taper it off a bit more with, with, with corn if you're preparing them for the following week. More corn, and, uh, fat feeds, and maybe a bit of oil on the food. Okay, and so that would be uh, Monday, Tuesday to Wednesday with the heavier feed? Yeah, generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that um, feeding has changed a lot over mm -hmm. recent years. I, I can remember many years ago, everyone used to go to Maryland's produce store and buy race mix. And most people just fed the race mix, no matter what it was. That, that's all they got seven days a week. Right. But it's become more, more scientific now, I think, with, yeah. with feeding. And, and people feed some wonderful things to their birds these days. But yeah, you know, I've also looked at um, you know, products you can give pigeons, and I've tried wherever possible the product should be as natural as you can give them. I, I try to stay away from, from drugs and antibiotics and such, but if you can build yep, them up so with natural medicate. products, all the best, you know. Yeah, it's um, and on on uh, basketing night, would you would you give them a full feed or half a feed? Uh, I used to feed if it was Friday night basketing, right? I used to try and feed them about two o'clock, no later than three. A full feed or half a no, feed? No, or... probably about the normal feed. If they're yeah. on an ounce a day, it would be an ounce. If it was a bit more, they got a bit more. And did you loft fly on basketing days? No, never, 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 never let them out because I think if something happens, if the falcons come, or something frightens them, whatever the case could be. That can spoil the birds a bit under stress. Mm -hmm. Now, plus, I think the birds need just to build up that one day, build up a little bit more before you send them away. You, you, you shouldn't, I don't think you should exercise them on the day of basketing. Yeah, that's fair enough. And for Thursday night basketing, would you, for the longer races, what would you, more peas, more fat, feed them on the day, anything different? <sighs> Probably more fat. Mm -hmm. If they're yep. going to be in the basket longer, a bit more fat food. Um, whether you're giving them uh, hemp seed, uh, different oil seeds, uh, but more fat, you know, and maybe in a little bit of fat on a, 
oil seeds on uh, oil product on, on the, the food. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it's um, so yeah. increase the feed. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember once reading a an article in, in a newspaper magazine, mm -hmm. and I think over the years I've sort of started to realise that it's probably right. And it was talking about human endeavours more or less when um, when uh, Wayne Pierce was playing football and. Um, what, I'm trying to think of the boxer's name now. Uh, de -de 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 bloke. <laughs> <laughs> they were talking about how they prepared for a fight. Right. And they used to say that getting leading up to a fight or a game of football it was protein. All the steak, all the high protein food they could eat. You know, to give them the energy and that. And, and then when the, oh, sorry, it was the other way. The they were eating, eating a lot of carbs, spaghetti, macaroni, whatever. Yep, carb loading. All the carb loading. And yep. then after the game of football or after a boxing match, it was protein yep. to put the muscle back onto their bodies. Yep, to repair the damage. And I think the same yep. thing can apply to pigeons. You know, yeah, I think so too. Build them up with energy. Uh, the days are gone when people used to think, oh, yeah, it was peas that give them all the benefits for racing. I think peas or high protein is more of a muscle builder and a recuperative, mm -hmm. where if you want them to have the energy, you've got to sort of look at giving them more I think it's one of Australia's most famous flyers, um, yeah, Graham Davison used to call them sinkers, the peas. So things changed a hell of a lot because I remember years ago, I, when I first went to Queensland, I met Steve Beverley and, and Lenny Vandlin, a few of them other top flyers up in Queensland. They were mad corn feeders. Everything was corn. You know, you can't give them enough. And then when I used to go to Melbourne and visit mm -hmm. a few of the old flyers down there, especially towards the end of the season, when Cumberland's season had finished, they were all peas, yeah. poppers full of peas. Yeah, it was just to two opposite extent, ex, you know, uh, extremes. And um, Queenslanders still to this day say peas are lead sinkers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about barley, Paul? Do you, some people believe in barley. Are you a barley feeder? Well, barley barley's come into vogue a lot in more recent years, and I believe in, in, in barley. I think um, a depurative mm -hmm. uh, with a high percentage of barley is uh, an essential food uh, for pigeons. And um, a lot of people use it to, to try and get the weight off pigeons a bit too because they'll only eat so much barley. Mm. You know, they don't particularly like it, but if they eat it, they, they, it takes the edge off their hunger. They'll only eat till the edge is gone. So you're not going to get full crops if you're if eating peas and all those other mixes. Okay. Now, so, Paul, uh, so we, we know sort of how your feeding and, and racing technique was. So now for, with the training of the birds, what do you like to look for in the birds before you put them into training? When do you decide that it's time to flag them or do you flag them? Well, I used to flag. I, I, I'm a little bit um, guilty. I'm a little bit like myself. Uh -huh. A bit rotundant and um, corpulent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to feed young pigeons too heavy. I was right. always a heavy feeder of young pigeons. And I think I, did, I think I was wrong in doing what I did. But my theories back then were, you know, the pigeons are developing. They need the proteins and they all that to shed their feathers to come new, and grow new feathers and whatever else. But then when it came then to get them into training, they were too fat, too heavy. And it took me a long time to get that fat off. And that's where barley started to come in to my vogue when I was training pigeons. It took a long time to get the pigeons going. And, uh, yeah, so I think it's, uh, you know, you've got to be careful with young pigeons mm -hmm. to get that balance right where they're not going to be overweight, but you're not going to harm them with their development and the molt. You, you know, get them through the molt, yeah. right. And so how long do you like to see them flying before you start tossing? Oh, well, I, I used to, and it comes down to time, Louis. Yep. I used to, and I had the time in my last job and when I retired, I always kept hens and cocks separate. And I'd always like to fly them separate. And towards the last few years I flew in Campbelltown Club, I used to fly the hens in the morning and I only wanted them to do 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And in the afternoon, I'd let the cocks out for 40, 45 minutes. And the reason for doing the way I was doing it was hens were always easy to control. You know, they'd come in when you wanted them to come in and you'd feed them and they'd go to their perch and rest. But when you let the cocks out in the mornings, and especially as it gets later towards the end of the season, they're not interested in going in. They want to go where the hens are. Mm -hmm. or they want to fly up on the roof. So I always used to let them out with about 15 minutes to spare before sunset. So you knew when they landed, they wanted to come in. It was getting dark and they wanted to feed. But again, that sort of comes down to um, your time, how much time you've got. If you're working, 
it's very hard to train to. And how far out from before the first race would you start getting the birds going? I used to like eight weeks. Eight weeks, and, yeah. And the, the theory always seems to be, oh, six weeks is plenty. But I've always worked on the, the, the system that if you get bad weather, you get behind very quick. Mm -hmm. And six weeks or, or less to put pigeons in a tossing, one or two bad weekends, especially if you work again, puts you way behind. So be prepared eight, for the unknowns. Yeah, eight weeks, you can be gentle, you can do it very steadily, but eight weeks you can get them going and you're not putting pressure on yourself mm -hmm. to do something stupid or on your pigeons. Right. Yeah, so I think eight weeks, as long as they're working well around the loft. Right, and, and, and how long do you consider working well? Oh, I want to, I'd like to see them you know, roam, disappear for a little while at least, you know, mm -hmm. not, not hang the loft all the time. But um, like I said, I've never been an hour, hour and a half. I, I see people have different ways of training. They like their birds to fly an hour and a half, two hours. I've often thought, you know, 45 minutes to an hour is, is plenty. So, yeah, do, do you monitor wing beats, uh, stuff like that, vigor, to look for the vigor in the sky? or you, oh, you, I look you, for vigor. You look I, the I, like, I like to see them race from one end of the sky to the other and then disappear and come mm -hmm. back. I don't like to see them just hanging around the loft with one leg tied to the loft. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think they've got to show a willingness to want to work. And when you do your first toss, Paul, how far would, would, would it have been? Um, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared. I say it's, it's not a problem, uh, an issue of having confidence in your pigeons or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just scared that you, you've, you've got to be gentle with them. Uh, again, time. You know, yeah. If you've got the time, you can do it. I used to take them, yeah, you know, only, only short, five kilometres, and people would say, your basket pigeon spent all that time just to take them five kilometres down the road. I said, it doesn't matter. I said, it's basket training. It's not raced or toss training. Let's get them in the basket, get used to it, coming out of the basket and going home. And once they're leaving on a regular basis, going fairly straight home, then mm -hmm. you move them. And after three or four tosses, say up to at least uh, 10, 15 kilometres, then you can start jumping them once you've got confidence in them. My last year in, in Campbelltown, because I wasn't in an ideal location, because I was always confident you know, Pigeon racing is a little bit like, a little bit like um, real estate agents. It's location, location. <laughs> you know, and I didn't buy in a top position. And uh, the fanciers of club members, when I used to race there, started you know, giving me a hard time because I bought in a place where I shouldn't have bought. And you have to come up with a, a scheme. And I, I worked out a scheme, which I think could apply to all fanciers, again, based on time. I would just basket the hens. I had, I think I had six Cumberland race baskets. I'd divide up the amount of hens I had in each basket. Mm -hmm. I'd take them, even, even on the longer tosses, I'd take them away. I was lucky with my wife, Helen. She's keen on the birds as well and would always assist. I'd just let one basket out. Sometimes I'd wait till she rang and said, they're home before I let the next, next basket out. And that might be only a dozen, 15 pigeons at a time. And I thought in the end, it worked well because you're training your pigeons to some extent to be leaders, not followers. That small right. group and a different mix of pigeons. You're not picking the same ones in a basket all the time. They just pick them up and put them in. Sure. And um, the other theory behind those small group tossing, if you let 100 pigeons out and a falcon comes, you can be in trouble, especially if a pair of falcons come. And they scatter the pigeons to the four winds. You wait all day to get them the next day and you lose a few. A small group, I think, gets going earlier. Um, the falcon don't seem to attack small groups as much as they do a big group. And if the falcon hits the first group, the chances are when you get the others out, they're going to get a dream run home. Right. That's and, my theory. And how many how many tosses would you have would you did you like to do before you started racing, Paul? And how far out? Um, nobody likes tossing off the north. But <laughs> if I was tossing off the north, I'm not sure about the distance. It would be the old toll gates at Karingai would be about as far as I would go. Yep. Um, off the south, um, which is easier tossing if you live in Campbelltown. Off the south, maybe Bargo on my own. Yeah. You know, down to Mittagong if you're going with the major clubs or, you know, fed, federation type tosses. And you tossed in the same direction or you changed the bird's no, direction? I, or? I, only line of flight. Only line of flight. Yep. Only line of flight, you know. Right, excellent, Paul. Well, that's excellent. Nice and healthy. Pigeon bloom, that's right. Oh, 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 oh. Settle. So Paul's got his number one hen here for us. He wants to show us the eye out in the sun. Guys, we're going to have a look. See how close we can get. 
It's for the eye sign lovers. That's it. And we can compare that to the youngsters in the sale. All right, let's get it. Paul, can you tell us what this is? Louie, welcome to the escape hatch. Aha. Uh -huh. this, is, this is the latest extension, if you want to call it that. I lost, in the last couple of years, I've lost two exceptionally good hens when I didn't have this. As soon as I opened that door, especially if you've got them on the tooth a little bit, I've had them come straight out of that door, into the wild blue yonder, and never seen again. Never to be seen of again. Never well, I need again. one of these at my place. I've lost the <laughs> stock bird or two. So this has been ideal you know, for that, to make sure nothing escapes. Mm -hmm. So enter the escape hatch. In we go. Watch your head. No worries. Guys, we're going to go check out some of uh, the stock birds and some of the birds that are going to be on the auction site. So don't forget, sign up to hopauctions.com.au. This no. is going to open this one. No, that's okay. Ah, here we are. I see you like to keep sand on the floor, Paul. Yeah, I've gone back to, to sand. I've tried different different um, litters on the floor, but I've just seemed to have gone back to sand. There's um, the nice slaties there. It makes it easy, you know. Um, Paul, you were mentioning something about the slates earlier that... Um, yes, I, uh, I wanted to do a bit of line breeding back to my old pair to keep that line going. And as it works out, I've, I end up breeding, I think, five slates. Mm -hmm. um, and they all go back to sort of, you know, some of the very old slates appear in different pedigrees. And I was surprised because I hadn't bred slates for many years. So I bred five, all very well bred. Like I say, they're line bred to my number one hen, which is this hen up here. That's Sharapova. You know, and, uh, and what was Sharapova? She's half Staff Van Reed, and then the rest of her is Jansen Van Loon. Now, she was the Federation, Cumberland Federation Bird of the Year. Right. And um, and we have some of her children in the sale, don't we? Yeah, oh, well, most of my pigeons, I could point at most of these pigeons, and they all have her bloodline in them somewhere, either as children or grandchildren. A so lot that's of children. The matriarch? Oh, you, you, you very well say that. And she has. Let's have a look at her. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. What I like about the Oh, look at that nice and gentle, mate. What I like about the van lenses, they're usually very, very quiet and calm. I mean, they're a bit um, on the edge now because I've got another person in the loft. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this hand, you know, she's got a bit of a, a step. Yeah, let's have a look Whoops, at that. Oh. saddle girl. Yeah, saddle. She's still got the, the vitality in her. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and she's got a fantastic eye. I mean... And you're an eye sign man, are well, you, Paul? I love eye sign. I don't place everything on it. But I, I like a bird with eye sign. I always reckon it's like I said earlier, it's like putting um, cream on top of the cake. <laughs> you know? I don't know if you pick that eye up much. Yeah, I'll just hold the sill and we'll come in. Oh, we haven't got enough light here, but. Oh, sorry. Let's see if I come around one. to the other eye, yeah. Because we do have a lot of eye sign fans out there. That's it. Oh, if we're going to hold the steel. Uh, the zoom is coming. Steady, girl. Steady. There we go. Yeah, for the eyesight fans there. I can take her outside. Yeah, we'll problem. take a photo with her in the lot out in the front early yeah. later. Yeah, so those. Um, and what uh, would you say? They're long keeled, short keeled, deep? No, not not overall. You know, she's. Um, I mean, she's an old hen too now, but oh, she's still in <laughs> in reasonable condition. Mm hmm. And birds not not working, only a small small environment they live in. I don't have a big loft. Yeah. But um, no, she's just an excellent pigeon. Even as a young bird, when she won Federation Bird of the Year, it was as a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. As a yearling, she got a couple of minor prizes, and I put her in the Federation um, All Age National. And it was right. a, it was a bad race that year. Bad race. weren't many birds home on the day. And she arrived home on the Thursday. Uh, so she battled on all the way and she came home on the Thursday. Then as a two-year-old, she reached the peak. Yeah. 
And she's bred. And she's bred. Like, she's the grandmother yep. of, of the pigeon that won the James Crawford Young Bird National on the south coast, and her daughter is in the sale. Ah, there you go. So And pe you... people say, why would you put the winner of a national in? And I said, well, if you're going to put something, put something in decent. Yep. And because I've got the parents and brothers and sisters, I said, well, I'll give it other flies an opportunity. Yeah. That's her there. You're happy to let it go. Yeah, let's have a look at it. Can check her with a tick eye. Yep. Check her with the tick eye, yeah, with the yellow ring. Yep. That's yep. the mother to the, the so, James Crawford National winner. Right. So there you go, guys. We are going to have in the sale a bird that has already produced a winner in the South Coast Fed Young Bird Derby. And oh. that was for Alan uh, Kerr, wasn't it? Graham. Graham. Yep. Sorry, Graham. Graham Kerr. Yeah. And, and, and the Kerrs, they have won one loft races. So this bird has bred a bird that can beat some of their birds, which is... Pretty bloody good thing, I reckon. Well, she's not the same colour as her mother because her father's a chick. I wonder if I can bid on her. <laughs> and um, she handles just like a mother. Right. Just like a mother. Let's have a look at that wing. And she's got a very similar eye. Great eyesight. I call her golden eye. And when you get her in the sun to have a good look, mm -hmm. you'll see what fantastic eyes. I will put have. up some photos of her eyes in the yeah. sale and we'll do and a video still of her confirmation. Up a, she's still bringing up a last flight. Yep. Sim sing it similar wing to a mother. Still got that slight step there. Mm -hmm. All right. That's it. That's a better shot. Oh, look at that. Look at that vibration. Yeah. A lot of trembling in that. That's great. She's got the muscle strength. I do like pigeons. And I, she's I, bred. That's the thing, guys. Yeah. This bird has bred. I, I like pigeons and a lot of the, the van loons, depending on what line they've been blended into, but a lot of the van loons, what I look for is a trait. Mm -hmm. is, this is a bad choice because she's bringing up a last flight. Right, and what's that trait? I like the last flight to be the same length as the second last flight or the ninth mm -hmm. or longer. Now, most right. birds, the last flight's shorter. I don't place any emphasis on why, but I'd prefer that last flight to be the same length or, mm -hmm. not, if not, longer than the ninth. Right. That's just a preference. Well, that's part of your selection criteria. And I think it's... it's um, I say to a lot of people with any family of pigeons, if they're a true family of pigeons, they carry certain traits, whether it's eye colour, uh, confirmation, wing. Now, you can follow, you can pick a pigeon and say, that's this. I've, I've seen people hand me pigeons in the past and say, oh, this is a Van Loon. I've looked at it, judged it against what I've got, and mm -hmm. I said, it's a very nice pigeon. But they didn't convince me that it was a Van Loon because I've, especially scrumpy side Van Loons, I know what I'm trying to... You're to very familiar for. with them. Yes. There's a pigeon in here. Yes. I might be out here now. Out in the flight. Where is it? Where is it in here? Oh, that, that young flighty. Yes. All right. Now, I bought that just recently. Again, at Steve Beverly's sale. That's how Steve Beverly's main van loons, and that's what I look for, that pattern in the wing, which is very silky. It's like a harlequin budgerigar. You can see all the, all that in the main part of the wing. It's got that lace lacing, if you want to call it that. All right. And the bar bars on the inbred ones can be faded, like that pigeon. They fade in a bit. So she's pretty well inbred, that hen. The, meat, uh, the grizzle hen, of course, goes without saying it, it's silver shadow line. Silver shadow, there she is. That's a, and he's, there's other pigeons in here that carry the colour, but they're not grizzles. Right. And she's the only grizzle I've got. And she's bred from a silver shadow cock, of course, and the mother's another very well-bred um, scrumpy van loon. Now, she's a she's a lovely hen. Is she appearing in the sale? No. No. Okay. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, I'm hanging on to her. I lent her to a, I lent her to a flyer last year, and he wanted to buy her. Mm -hmm. He was so impressed with the youngins. He bred us, look, I've loaned her to you. You bred what you, you needed. I lent him a cock to go with her. And then at the recent sale, there was a couple there that Steve had as Van Loon crosses, and I bought them for him because mm -hmm. yeah, he was so keen on them. Well, perhaps we might get something out of her next year then. Well, you never know. You never yeah, know. We'll wait for a few more reports. Yeah, so these are, there's a couple of young cocks in here because yes. I, I leave the young cocks with the hens till they mature you know, so they don't get bashed up by the, the old big cocks. boys. Yeah. But, um, okay, and we've we got another bird we can see that's in the sale for. Sorry? We will do some. Is there another bird here that we can see that's going in the sale? Uh, we are going to do some comprehensive videos of the birds in the Vingerly. 
but it'd be nice to hear from you a little bit about him. So we are having a direct daughter of his number one bird in the sale who has already produced combine winning birds in a very prestigious loft in the south coast guys so again if we if you if you're interested hopauctions.com.au there she is the matriarch of the next of next generation lofts paul gibbs Here we go. go through into the cock section yeah sure let's do it some of these hens will come back in here and i'll be able to catch the ones i've got marked for the sale no problem i've got real pink um jazz beans on oh that's one of them is it yeah, she's a lovely she's late bread yeah so she's a lovely hen. and her eye for such a, a baby is fantastic her and her brother because they're late breads off going back to the number one hen will both be in the sale yeah. so you get years of breeding out of the pigeons like that because they're only babies may not get them off of babies off them this year because they're late bred but mm -hmm. you never know later in the season they might be ready to I don't like that fee, yeah, yeah. But, but they're very well bred. That's the important part. Good things come to those who wait. Well, I am not opposed to buying old <laughs> hens. I mean, I bought Ralph Goodacre's um, number two hen, and she's a 2012, and she's bred for me. So I think if they've got that, the genetics in them, it's not going to disappear because they're old. It's there. It's in the blood. This cock, it will be in the sale. In the middle? Yep, check a cock, light check. He's another one going back to the old hen. Mm -hmm. And I put a couple, I've tried to put a couple of stock birds into the, into the sale um, to give people the opportunity to get as close as possible to something they can breed off straight away. He's a beauty, I wasn't gonna part with him, but like I say, I've got many brothers and sisters you know, the, the, in here. Oh, he's handsome. And he's a lovely cock. Yeah, but the, he'll, he'll be one of the ones in the sale of the older pigeons. Right. There's um, – so when I point some of the – that's a full sun to the number one pair. That's a full sun. Um, his full brother, the, young, the, the pencil, he, again, with that laced wing. Right, right, yep, I see. His you. nest mate brother, he looks exactly like him. I, I picked one of them. I didn't have a favourite, but I picked one that's going to be. So you're the selling sale. the type of birds that you also keep for yourself. Yeah, yeah. That cock's another son. That cock's another son. The so slate's one of the new ones this year. That I, I, I blind bred and they, they're mm -hmm. starting to throw slates. I'll be a, a hen the same as these slates in the sale. Right. And these slates are Jansen? They've got some well, Jansen, the Jansen color. It's the Jansen colouring, but there's a lot of um, Van Loon in the pigeons. But the slate colour is coming from some of the older lines of the the, Van, uh, the Jansons when I look back right through their pedigree mm -hmm. going right back to eye camps pigeons now the flits um Miss Saigon right and those sort of pigeons go right back in the birds pedigree and was there a Thunderbolt as well well Thunderbolt it was Keith Sager's champion race pigeon mm -hmm. that's in that pigeon as well and the Shalaki or I don't know how you pronounce it the one of Greg Hamilton oh, that's good enough you know it, um so I was just surprised I bred five this year, and I've, I've decided to let one go. I've kept two cocks, two hens. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm forever overstocked. Um, uh, Paul, you we were chatting earlier about um, inbreeding and line breeding, and you said there was a point where you, you really need to look for some crosses. And at what point would you say that is? Uh, well, when you find something that you think might just give them a bit more speed. Now, mm -hmm. the van loons are not necessarily a speed pigeon. Yeah, I, I always say the van loons are good, 200 to 600k pigeons, um, kilometre race pigeons. They seem to do that real well. Uh, more so around, say, 300 to 6. Two-day racing, I'm not really a, a, a fan of them performing over two two days. Like 500 miles, if you're going to send them, if it's a good day, with plenty of pigeons home on the day, they'll do it. But if it goes into the second day, you know, being honest, I don't think they like two-day racing. Right. So, so again, if, if we were talking about the... So with a cross, mm -hmm. I've been looking, because I like, I've always liked up to 600k, one day racing. So is that's my what you're breeding for, for right? Yep. So what I've been trying the last couple of years is Herman Coistus. Right. And all off the Olympia line. Mm -hmm. So some of those Herman Coistus pigeons, is this one up here, this checker cock. He's a lovely cock. Oh, he is. 
Uh, yep. He's getting on a little bit too now, as you can see around his ice here and water. But here's one. Yep. This so is, you've put that in the birds for a bit of speed. Yep. And 600 k's the distance that you're breeding for. Oh, and yeah, that the yeah. birds are performing at, which is a perfect distance for one loft racing. Well, it is too for all the other major races in the season. All the money prizes. Money prizes. Yeah, yeah. all the money races. The Breeders, is your ring, ring races and um, you know, Young Bird Derby, they're all under that 600k mark. Uh, and I, I'm one of those guys too that I said to you earlier, mm -hmm. I don't like mornings. I'm not an early morning person. So to get up and wait for two-day races... Helen gets up. I'd be in bed and Helen would be up waiting for pigeons. And quite often she'd come running into the bedroom saying, we got one, we got one. Paul's at home <laughs> dreaming of uh, pedigrees and how to breed. And I'm still asleep. <laughs> and she's timing them in. Oh, I just, not... So, so Paul, how, how, how like uh, father-daughter matings? You do father-daughter matings? I've not tried it yet. No? No? Well, what's the, the way you like to line breed? Um, I, I wanted to go, like I, I've done this year, I think it's... Um, one as, as a father to a great great granddaughter is how I bred the slates. Right. I didn't want to go back, let it let go too much longer. Some people say father, daughter, brother, sister. I've tried not to go too close. Um, it might work well if you're looking for something specific, um, but I haven't really looked at it. I, I was thinking maybe this year, my, my base number one pair, maybe putting them to. You know, father to daughter, mother to son, but I'm, I'm still contemplating. Okay. You know, I'm still contemplating. This is another great, not nice looking Olympiad Herman Coyce. It's a checker flight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is a nice looking he's bird, a nice isn't cock. he? He's a real nice cock. And, um, and they, they cross well because it doesn't, what I look for if I'm crossing pigeons, I don't want to change the style. You know, the hand, or how they feel in the hand, the way they look, size. The cross pigeon going in mustn't alter the style of my old pigeons. It's got to add genetically to it, but not change the style. Right. So you can get pigeons that are too long, too bulky, and also, like I said to you, early inside, I've got a few um, Vanderbolts to try. Yeah. Man, are they bulky pigeons. Yeah, they are. And we've got some Vanderbolts in the sale? No, because I haven't. I've okay. only had a couple, and I haven't used them to cross yet. I've brought a few more to try to cross this year when I've had a couple more. And he's waiting for them to be proven, guys. He doesn't just sell things no, just like that. that. If they don't reach, make the grade, what's the point of keeping them? Well, correct, correct. So correct. His, his, full, his full brother's a nice cock. Looks very similar, but he's got... Oh, what's over there? That's his full brother, that flighty you were just looking at. Another oh, yeah. flighty. Yep, in the corner there. Yeah, full brother. Just lovely pigeons. They yeah. are, aren't they? They are beautiful pigeons. Yeah. And you can see this is the sort of pigeon... Um, I've, I've put a full brother to him in the sale. Now, he's the Sagan, Patrick Brock's right. Sagan. I've put two because I've got too many. I've kept mm -hmm. a couple, um, but I've put two in just in case people are interested. This cock, are popular birds. this cock here with a laced wing, he's in the sale. Oh, yeah. That's the full brother, the one we were looking at in here. I said, the, the peas in the pod. I just selected one. For no particular reason. Just so no. you're keeping one and you're selling one. I'm selling yeah. one. He, he's a lovely cock. He, he's back to the, the good ones. Yeah. The, the, the old family. And we were looking at a, uh, a pied, a flighty pied in there, and I was talking about the lace on the wing. Yep. And how pale the colour on the wings are. And you can see that in that type of pigeon, you know, that coming through. But yeah, uh, so the traits of the family uh, are in the birds. I try to keep the trait. I don't, like to, I don't want to change the style of the pigeon, you know. I really don't. Okay. And what have we got over in the last section? More cocks. More cocks, yeah. Watch and Paul, do you, are you, are you, do you believe that the it's the cock or the hen that um, I don't know. breeds the winners? I don't know. I've, I've, read, I've read a fair bit. I know some people say the hen. I'm, I'm probably more inclined to think the hen, only mm -hmm. on what I've read, you know. So there's another slate being bred this year. It's a beautiful looking bird. Um, that's the one I recently bought at Steve Beverly's. Now remember I said they got that lacing mm -hmm. in the colour. He's a bit older cock, but he's a cock I bought to put back into the family again. Yeah. That lacing showing you something, it's showing you performance yeah, in the past. This one, he's got because he's going back to the old hen, he doesn't have as much. But, but he's still like got it. Yeah, he's still got that bit of lace patterning in the wing, which is a trait. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Now she's he's he's only a a, a grandson. Right. It's funny, you know, the old hen. Um, this year was the first year she's bred blue bars. Right. Every other, all these other pigeons I've been showing you all checkers. She's yeah. paired to the the bird of the year cock. Mm -hmm. Never produced a blue bar, and I've had them together for bloody years. But um, when I put her back to her great great grandson, which is this slate cock, right? That's what he hasn't thrown a slate paired to the old hen. He's thrown blue bars and blue bar pieds. And that's the first time she's thrown thrown a, a blue bar coloured pigeon. But these other ones, like this cock, um, with these cocks, like I showed you on the other side, mm -hmm. this cock, this cock, this cock, uh, this cock, they're all brothers. They're all yep. back to the old pair. Which is which is awesome, Paul, because you're keeping some of the birds that you're selling, and these aren't birds that you know aren't performing. You know that they're breeding on for you. They're working for others. Come on. What's Paul going to show us now? Oh. Don't you go in there. there. Is. Hey, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you next time, mate. That's the number one cock. He's That's the, the old cock. Oh, I'd be nice to be able to see him. He'll, he'll come back in here when we go out. We'll get him catch him. Yeah. But okay. no, it's, um, now this is another one that I've bred this year and kept. Right. Steady. And Paul, what, what, what would you say? Would you rate your birds as a, a larger sized bird, a medium sized bird? Medium, to, medium, medium to large. I mean, the cocks can get a bit big. Yep. The hens are small or medium, but the cocks can be. You know, look at a cocks like this cock, and some of them are nearly, nearly two handed jobs. Right. Of course, they're getting fat. They're only just sitting here. They yeah, exercise. they're not training. Yeah. But Let's what I like his wing is they're, they're a lengthy pigeon. Some of those. What seven? Like I say, he's only a baby. Mm -hmm. cool. Let's get in on that eye there. They've got a lot of character, and I say they, they generally, I mean, you're, you're in the lock. Yeah, but generally they're very quiet. You can just go and just pick them up off the perch you know that they're not uh there's stranger danger yeah well they're not towy pigeons yeah oh here's a beauty we got there paul this is speck speck <laughs> i call him speck people say what do you call him speck and i say where is it unless he's molded it out we've got one white there it is there one it is white... uh -huh. one white little feather I'll call him Speck. He's <laughs> a nice big fella. He's got that colouring you talk about. The um, yeah, he's got that mottly lace, mm -hmm. even though he's a slaty colour. Uh, I'm a fan of the third bar, there. Paul. You rate the third bar at all? Oh, he's got the step he's as well. The, step. Yeah. the curve on the wing as well. The other thing I, I do Let's like. See if we can get his his uh, better shot of his wing. What I do like in, in, in pigeons, mm -hmm. what I look for is. The hands finger spacings in the last flights. I don't like them when they're overlapped or closed. You know, broad, real broad flights. So what's called ventilation? Yeah, yeah. And and more so on, on some pigeons, not necessarily this one. It's like I call it like a hunting knife, mm -hmm. where this part of the blade of the knife is narrow. It, it's got that shape of a hunting knife. And it's got a curved edge going in towards the quill. Right. Uh, just, just a fad. I'm not going to say there's, you know, there's this sort of thing happens and this sort of thing happens if you've got this wing. Just that I like that sort of wing. That's part of your selection criteria. Yeah. Good underneath the wings. I like them with, again, I think in Jeff Shepard was showing under the wings. Yep. Long and square. Yeah. You know? And they've got that. And if they've got four, the better. Most have got three, but if they've got four under the wing, the better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Long and square is good, so they say. So they say. Well, thanks for letting us have a look at the, uh, all your birds today, Paul. You're welcome. Um, I've been impressed, and I hope some of the buyers um, got a chance to see what they'll be bidding on today. So, guys, once again, thanks for watching. Sign up to hopauctions.com.au, and good luck in the upcoming auction.